Okay, so my title here is uh, A Two-Dimensional Perspective on Methane Isotope Clumping. So what I mean by that is I'm going to be telling you about the utility of using two rare isotopologues of methane. Um, before I get too far into it, I'm listing just a partial list of the names of people who've contributed to everything that I'm going to be talking about because we have the lab, we do the analyses, but we're relying all the people in the audience here and, and, and their colleagues to tell us what to measure, what's interesting to measure, and of course help us with the interpretations. So a long list of names, and they're in no particular order. You know, Barbara Sherwood Lawler, for example, has been an integral part of what our thinking from the very beginning, warned us that we were hopelessly naive right in the beginning, and then she's helped us sort of limp along. Um, Doug Rumble, of course, has been instrumental in all this. this uh, Tom McCullum, Tina Troida, Sebastian Krauss, I just go down the whole list. So all these people have contributed uh, something to what I'm going to be saying. Uh, and also I want to mention that all of this is evolving even at this meeting. Okay, so before I talk about isotope clumping in methane, I want to bring us back to the whole idea of using rare isotopologues of a gas phase to trace process. And um, rare isotopologues, of course, are very common in chemistry and astronomy for all kinds of reasons. But in geochemistry, it became very popular because of the idea of breaking the, the difficulty of using um, uh, carbonates in the oceans to estimate paleo temperatures, so temperatures. So going all the way back to Harold Urey, the idea was that you could use the thermodynamic distribution of oxygen 18 and 16 as it partitions between water and carbonate to get at a paleo temperature for the oceans. But of course it became clear very early on that there's two reasons why the oxygen isotope ratio of a carbonate might vary. It could be temperature, which I'm trying to represent on the left here, or it could be the composition of the water. So this is an example of a heterogeneous thermodynamic system where you're relying on partitioning between two phases. So if you, instead of relying on the partitioning between two phases, if you have an intra-phase uh, thermodynamic parameter, in this case the distribution of isotopes across bonds, like for example putting two heavy isotopes on a bond, now you don't have to worry about the phase that you no longer have present, for example, the water. You only have to worry about the phase that you have in your hand. In this case, it would be carbonate, and in our case, it would be a gas. So this is proving to be a very popular technique, uh, the, and it breaks this so-called degeneracy between, for example, uh, ice volume and temperature in paleothermometry of the oceans. So our idea back in 2008 was to uh, apply this idea to methane uh, and, to see, and to take the full information content that exists with the different isotopes that can exist in a molecule of methane and get at the provenance of the methane, because it was very clear that the provenance of methane was a big outstanding problem in understanding carbon. Um, you will have seen a diagram like this many times. I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but you'll recognize that one of the principal tools that's been used to understand the provenance of methane is the carbon isotope ratio on the x-axis against the, the hydrogen isotope ratio on the y-axis. And you'll see the different fields. Um, this is just one rendition of it. And all you're supposed to take away from this diagram is there's dots all over the fields. The dots all don't always form nicely and separate into beautiful fields. There's a lot of overlap. The principal reason for that is this diagram, by necessity, confuses source with process. So the idea of using the rare isotopologues was to break that degeneracy by using an intramolecular, or perhaps better said, an intraspecies partitioning of isotopes across different molecules. So here I'm just showing the equilibrium 13CH4 plus 12CH3D goes to make a doubly substituted 13CH3D. Uh, you saw this yesterday in, uh, in Shuhei Ono's talk. Um, so the idea is, take the equilibrium, the temperature equilibrium uh, uh, that's defined by thermodynamics for one of the rare isotopologues, 13D, and then to do the same thing for the doubly deuterated species, so we have two curves here, combine the two curves onto a single diagram, and now you have essentially a temperature concordia diagram, where if a molecule forms or reset at a temperature that's in thermodynamic equilibrium with itself, a bunch of molecules, then they will reside on this curve. So we're interested in when those things are on that curve and when they're not on that curve and what it means. Okay, so back in 2008, I was saying, everyone's telling Genesis stories, so I'll tell you a Genesis story. So in 2008, I'm having lunch. I wasn't going to tell the story, but I still think it's funny. So I was having lunch <laughs> with Doug Rumble and Bob Hazen, 
And Bob Hazen was all of a sudden in command of a huge amount of money from the Sloan Foundation, and he said, and I'll tell you, I wasn't gonna say this, but it was a job interview, okay? And he said, how could you spend this money? And I said, I'd like to build a large geometry gas source mass spectrometer. And we started thinking, how could we apply this to carbon? And the idea of doing isotope clumping in methane emerged. I didn't get the job, <laughs> but I got the mass spectrometer. <laughs> so, so here's the panorama mass spectrometer that resulted from that meeting, uh, built by New Instruments. We partnered with New, New Instruments to build it. And the whole idea of this was to separate the two mass 18 isotopologues of methane. Okay, so there's the instrument. And here's sort of the, the money slide for what we've been doing with our lives for the last four years as it pertains to methane. Each one of the dots on this diagram on the left, which is that diagram that I showed you the genesis of, that isotopologue, it's like a three isotopologue diagram for the you isotopomists out there. So um, every, every one of those dots has a story to tell. And in the time I have, I don't have time to tell those stories, but I just wanna sort of talk about the, gen the origins of the different um, elephants in the room on this diagram. The main thesis of what I'm gonna say, oops, I did it, I said I wasn't gonna do it. The main thesis of what I was gonna say is that the diagram on the left I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you is mainly about process and the diagram on the right is process plus source. So let me give you one obvious example. These blue dots here are from Boreal Lakes. They are what we believe the products of methanogenesis and they plot right on top of a bunch of methanogenesis experiments that we've done with collaborators in the laboratory. Those are the crosses. And notice the blue dots on, the, uh, on this diagram plot at very low delta D. The reason they plot at really low delta D compared to some other biogenic gases is because they are formed from water that's really low in delta D. So that's where the source is affecting where those things plot on this diagram. But over here, we don't think that that has much of an effect. It's just process. So the first question, I'm gonna do two things in the rest of the talk. I'm gonna talk about this elephant in the room. Why are microbial data way down here on this diagram? And then later at the end, I'm gonna talk about what's going on up here with some high temperature sources of methane. And all of this is devoted to developing this tool so that we can figure out where methane's coming from when there's a debate. Okay, so um, here's just a, a, a little diagram showing you how one pathway for producing uh, methane during microbial methanogenesis. And the thing I want you to get from this diagram is that there's multiple steps. So I took these multiple steps and write them this way. There's basically seven steps for making a methane molecule from a CO2 molecule and hydrogen by, uh, by uh, hydrogenotrophic methanogenesis. So that you have these seven steps and each one of those steps is gonna have an isotope fractionation factor associated with it for hydrogen as you're uh, taking hydrogens off a molecule and then adding hydrogens to C1 to carbon one over and over and over again. Each one has an isotope fractionation factor. And there's an analogous process, the abiotic process of, of Fischer-Tropsch type reactions or Sabatier type reactions when they're uh, surface mediated and they actually have a similar set of seven steps. And we understand the fractionation factors for the, for the inorganic process pretty well, better than we do the fractionation factors associated with the enzymatic process. So I'm suggesting that we can do modeling using the inorganic as a sort of um, a proxy for the enzymatic process. So we have the same kind of like seven steps. You make an alcohol-like thing, then you make a formaldehyde-like thing, then you add hydrogen successively to C1. We kind of know what those fractionation factors look like. And if you follow that analogy, um, what you learn is that there's a number of physical chemical processes that are gonna be involved in each one of those steps. So actually, if I go back one, uh, yeah, it, it, a physical chemical, yeah. So one of them is quantum tunneling. So we have to think about quantum tunneling as a possibility for affecting the isotopic composition of, of the isotopologue distribution that we're looking at. I think this is important for some of the samples, but I don't wanna get too much into it, but I just wanna show you that that is one way to get a big isotopologue effect. Uh, another way to get a big isotopologue effect is what I'm gonna be referring to as a combinatorial effect. So this is the math lesson part of the talk. If you think of X as being a mole fraction of an isotope or an isotopologue in a sample of gas, there's two uh, ways of looking at, at, the, uh, at the average composition. One is the arithmetic mean. When you take a sample of gas and you get a bulk isotope ratio, that's an arithmetic mean. But the isotopologues are actually expressing a geometric mean. So they're a product of iso individual isotope ratios from distant reservoirs multiplied together 
to form this geometric mean. And it's a truism that there's an inequality between the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean, which is the geometric mean is always less than the arithmetic mean. So the result of that is that um, you get a, a, an apparent a shift in isotopolog ratios as a consequence of that inequality of the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean. So what that means is, no pun intended, is that you're going to get anti-clumping, you're going to get negative clumping values as a result of mixing different reservoirs that have different isotope ratios together to form a molecule. So let's say you have a, a reservoir that has one DDH ratio and a reservoir that has another DDH ratio, and they combine to make a bunch of molecules of methane. Those methanes will have an apparent deficit in the CH2D2, for example, because of the inequality of the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean. And so you get a parabola-like shape here because of that process. Now, the reason we're interested in this is I showed you that microbial field is really has a huge deficit in CH2D2. Why does it have a huge deficit? Uh, one possibility is it's just this mathematical artifact of the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean, which is a simple shorthand way of saying that it's some sort of statistical combinatorial effect. So that's really what we're going to explore. So if we take uh, this model and put it in the computer and assign a fractionation factor that people tell us we should assign to each one of these steps, and consider what could happen in the context of different D to H reservoirs being produced at each step, um, you can produce the kinds of things that we see in the microbial data. So for example, um, if you have uh, uh, different degrees of equilibration in each step, depending on how many different steps are reversible versus those that are not reversible, you get the different stars I'm showing here. So the gist of this is I can produce the very negative CH2D2 that is a signature of microbial genesis uh, in, a, in a sample just by considering this combinatorial effect. Now, this is just theory, really. But we uh, had the good fortune of pairing up with the Dartmouth group. Uh, Will Levin and his student, Lena Tenzer, came to visit the lab. And they had a vehicle for testing this idea. It wasn't actually the original thought, but it turned into this. That is, if we take this P. stutzeri organism, which takes uh, hydrogen from water and takes hydrogen from a pre-existing methyl group, CH3. And these organisms break the, the methyl phosphonate, take the methyl, add one hydrogen to it from the water. Now you have a mixed reservoir. Okay? So if that we can uh, play around with the isotopic composition of the water, we can see whether or not this process that I was telling you about, this inequality between the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean, really manifests itself. So we did that in the lab. And we uh, spiked the water with a lot of deuterium. So you get these wild ratios on the x-axis. And the methane that was produced correlates with it perfectly. And taking that correlation, we can make a model. And the model results in uh, no variation in the 13D isotope clumping of methane, but big variations in the H2D2 on the right. And they form that parabolic shape. And in fact, you can make a model for that parabolic shape based on the kinetics and the isotopolog compositions. And the model is not so bad a fit to those actual data. So this is the first real proof in the lab that this idea of a combinatorial effect could be the principal source of the variability in H2D2 that is, for example, a marker for a microbiogenic methane. So we're getting at process here, as I was saying to you before. We, we get some idea of what the process is. OK, so you can imagine we have all these different ways of making methane um, enzymatically. So the hydrogenotrophic has multiple steps. So we have these multiple steps, each one with a different fractionation. That causes the big deficit, which causes our, our microbial field. In the case of methylotrophic uh, pathways, you're mixing a methyl group with another source of hydrogen. And again, you'll get the really low values. So that also explains why they're down in that microbial field and so forth. OK. And in fact, we can, we can uh, break out the, the uh, samples that we've done in the laboratory already between methylotrophic pathways and hydrogenotrophic pathways. But we're trying not to just draw you know, boundaries around groups of points on diagrams. We really are trying to understand the mechanism. And so I hope I've given you some idea of what the mechanism is that's controlling how far down on this diagram you are. OK, so now I want to just turn to one. I, I, I wanted to pick one. Uh, troublesome but interesting high temperature example of the application of these rare isotopologues to the provenance of methane. So I'll turn to the Lost City 
uh, hydrothermal field as an example, and you've heard a lot about Lost City, and you're going to hear about it in the next talk. Uh, you all know that it's a hydrothermal field uh, just off axis from the Mid-Atlantic uh, Mid Ridge. And I just want to point out, well, so here's my obligatory um, video. I was trying to figure out, I'm a laboratory scientist principally, so I was trying to figure out how I can get a drone into my, into my talk. <laughs> and the panorama is big, but you don't really need a bird's eye view from a drone to see it. So this is my, this is my equivalent of a drone. Okay. So they're sampling at Lost City. And the question is, where is the methane coming from? Now, in the chapter of the book that you picked up the other night, we put this figure in. And this figure shows that it's possible that when we measure a sample of Lost City up here above the equilibrium line, that you could explain it by mixing between microbial gas and a high temperature gas. And this is an object lesson, and it's good to collect more than one data point. Because, <laughs> because since that book that's already out of date, sorry, we collected more data. So here I'm showing you data from uh, Lost City from other vents that are at lower temperature. And we think actually that these are, these are the on-axis data from, from the, the hot uh, vents that are giving us temperatures of 300 to 400 degrees. But here you're seeing an array of data that look like they're forming a mixing trend between low temperature equilibrated gas and high temperature equilibrated gas. So what I would say now, unlike six months ago, is we don't see any trace of microbialgenic gas in the methane sampling from Lost City. What we see is a, a trace of low temperature gas mixed with some high temperature gas. Now it gets even worse because Gibran Labidi, the postdoc who has collected these data, made a plot that you see on the left and another plot that you see on the right. And on the left you're seeing the H2D2 versus the fluid temperature coming out of the vents. And on the right you're seeing the same but for 13D. And what this is telling us is that H2D2 records temperatures even low temperatures upon resetting, whereas the 13D only partially resets. So we're actually seeing one isotopal log resetting and the other one not resetting, and so we're looking at, uh, we're, we're really looking at something that records, has the capacity to record different stages of thermal evolution as the methane is uh, climbing up through the system. Okay, one last slide, I know I'm over, but one last slide, which is I didn't want you to think that this big mass spectrometer that we built can only do methane. So here's one slide of, of nitrogen clumping. So we, we discovered a, a couple years ago that there's a huge excess of 15N, 15N in the air th uh, that you breathe. Not that you breathe nitrogen, but you know what I mean. So the 15N, 15 is 19.2 uh, per mil in excess of what thermodynamics would allow in air, and only in air. So we have this beautiful tracer of air. So now we can go to places like Yellowstone and look at fumaroles or, or uh, effusions from springs and we can tell whether the nitrogen is actually from air, whether it's contaminated with air, or whether it's really nitrogen coming from the mantle. And that's important. So for example here, many of you will know mantle delta 15N values are around minus seven per mil, but when we look at Iceland, for example, a minus seven per mil or minus five per mil gas is 100% air, but it's fractionated air, not mantle gas. So we have this beautiful tracer now of air contamination for nitrogen, which is leading to all kinds of interesting things. So anyway. I, I, will, uh, I will end just with, these are all things we hope to be able to apply to effusions from extra, <laughs> extraterrestrial values. Max is laughing. Why are you laughing? <laughs> it could happen. No, there's no panorama there. But Shuhei is working on spectroscopic methods, and we'll figure it out. So anyway, the I, but it's, it's not entirely a joke, right? The beauty of it is if you are using rare isotopologues, you don't have to know the isotopic composition of the different reservoirs. All you have to know is how the clumping works. It's process rather than source. So when you go to another planet, you can do process without knowing source, and that's a huge advantage, actually. Okay, I'll stop there.